Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to go over an overview of a variety of different porphyria conditions and we're going to talk about specifically two of the most common porphyria conditions later on in the lesson. So porphyrias are inherited metabolic disorders of heme synthesis leading to accumulation of porphyrin precursors. And the exception to this rule of being inherited is porphyria cutanea tarda or PCT which is often caused by an acquired inhibitor. We're going to talk about more about porphyria cutanea tarda later on in the lesson. Each enzyme in heme synthesis has a corresponding porphyria disorder, so it's important to know the heme synthesis pathway in general. All of these disorders are rare, and their clinical presentation is quite varied. The integumentary system, gastrointestinal system, and nervous system can all be affected in different ways with each of these different conditions. So we're going to quickly talk about the heme synthesis pathway. Heme synthesis requires the amino acid glycine and succinyl-CoA, and these two components are used by the enzyme ALA synthase to produce aminolevulinic acid, or ALA. ALA synthase is inhibited by hemin, and this will become important later on in the lesson. The next step requires two ALA, which are used by the enzyme ALA dehydrase to produce porphobilinogen. Any... The next step requires four porphobilinogens, which are used by the enzyme uroporphyrinogen 1 synthase to produce uroporphyrinogen 1. Deficiencies or issues in Euro 1 synthase lead to the condition known as acute intermittent porphyria. We're going to talk more about acute intermittent porphyria later in the lesson. The next step requires the enzyme uroporphyrinogen 3 co-synthase to produce uroporphyrinogen 3 from uroporphyrinogen 1. Issues with uroporphyrinogen 3 co-synthase lead to a condition known as congenital erythropoietic porphyria. Uroporphyrinogen 3 can then be processed by uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase to coproporphyrinogen 3, and issues with the enzyme urodecarboxylase lead to porphyria cutanea tarda. When we have coproporphyrinogen 3, the enzyme coproporphyrinogen uh, oxidase can produce protoporphyrinogen 9. Issues with this enzyme lead to the condition of hereditary coproporphyria. And protoporphyrinogen oxidase can act on porf protoporphyrinogen 9 to produce protoporphyrin 9. And issues with this enzyme lead to porphyria variegate. Protoporphyrin 9 can then be acted on by the final enzyme in the pathway ferrochelatase to produce heme. And issues with ferrochelatase lead to a condition known as erythropoietic protoporphyria. So now that we've looked at the entire pathway and the various conditions associated with each of the enzymes in the pathway, we're going to talk about specifically porphyria cutanea tarda. Again, this is due to a deficiency in uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, and it's the most common porphyria condition. Again, it's caused by a reduced activity of uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase, which is a hepatic enzyme, and is generally due to an acquired inhibitor. We're going to talk about some of these inhibitors in a little bit. However, having a heterozygous uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase mutation predisposes to porphyria cutanea tarda, which is an autosomal dominant trait. So there are some genetic components to getting porphyria cutanea tarda. If you have already one of your alleles with a mutation, you're more likely to get porphyria cutanea tarda, but you don't necessarily have to have it. You can have an acquired inhibitor that can actually lead to porphyria cutanea tarda without having this mutation. But the mutation can predispose you to having it. So what are some of these triggers that can lead to 
inhibition of your porphyrinogen decarboxylase. Some of them include iron. So having a condition of hemochromatosis, iron overload can actually lead to reduced activity of your porphyrinogen de decarboxylase and onset of porphyria cutanea tarda. Others include infections like hepatitis C infection, HIV. Some others include alcohol, smoking, estrogen use, and other medical conditions that can lead to liver damage. These could include non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. The onset of porphyria cutanea tarda generally occurs mid to late life. And in general, males equal females in incidence. So the symptoms and the presentation of porphyria cutanea tarda are due to accumulations of the porphyrinogen. So anything before the uroporphyrinogen decarboxylase enzyme in the heme synthesis pathway can begin to accumulate. And these become auto-oxidized to photosensitizing porphyrin, uh, porphyrins. They can lead to blisters, lesions, and scars generally in sun-exposed areas like the hands. And this is where a lot of the myths of vampires have come from. Individuals with porphyria cutanea tarda are sensitive to sun, and they actually become burned and affected by sunlight. Other presentations of porphyria cutanea tarda include excessive hair growth like hypertrichosis. And with the blisters, lesions, scars, they can also have tense vesicles and bullae. And again, all of these occur on sun-exposed skin. So the diagnosis of porphyria cutanea tarda is an interesting one, and it's important to recognize and to remember. Diagnosis of porphyria cutanea tarda involves looking at the urine of an individual that you suspect has porphyria cutanea tarda, 5% HCL, and a wood lamp. So look at their urine under a wood lamp, and you can see the porphyrins. So this is a very important point to remember is that the diagnosis of porphyria cutanea tarda involves looking at their urine. Once we've made the diagnosis, how do we treat it? Treatment involves avoiding sunlight. So because the blistering, the lesions, excess of hair growth occurs in sun exposed skin, we avoid sunlight. That is the treatment for this condition. However, in other cases where iron might be the cause of porphyria cutanea tarda, like in hemochromatosis, phlebotomy might actually be used, so bloodletting might actually be used to treat porphyria cutanea tarda. And again, this is in cases where high iron load is actually causing the porphyria cutanea tarda. The next condition we're going to talk about is acute intermittent porphyria. Acute intermittent porphyria is due to an inherited mutation of the enzyme uroporphyrinogen 1 synthase. It is an autosomal dominant condition but has a very low penetrance. And it is the second most common porphyria. porphyria. So porphyria cutanea tarda is number one. Acute intermittent porphyria is number two. Because uroporphyrinogen 1 synthase is earlier step in the heme synthesis pathway. Any issues with this enzyme will lead to elevations of the precursors aminolevulinic acid or ALA and porphobolinogen or PBG. So you get accumulations of porphobolinogen and aminolevulinic acid. ALA and PBG accumulations can actually cause acute attacks of what we call neurovisceral symptoms. In the, the acute attacks can develop over hours to days and may last for weeks. The abdominal symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria are wide ranging. These include abdominal pain. This is the most common. Other symptoms can include vomiting, constipation, and diarrhea. Constipation more common than diarrhea. For neurological symptoms, it includes muscle weakness, convulsion, and peripheral neuropathy, so sensory loss. And other signs and symptoms of acute intermittent porphyria include hypertension, tachycardia, chest pain, 
having red urine, so their urine will actually look quite red, and hyponatremia. And this is due to an SIADH, so a syndrome of inappropriate ADH. So if you see an individual with neurovisceral symptoms, consider acute intermittent porphyria on your differential diagnosis, although this condition is still very rare. So what are some of the triggers for intermittent, uh, acute intermittent porphyria? Triggers include alcohol and smoking. Hormones like estrogens and progesterone can also be a trigger. So attacks generally occur after puberty. And women have more attacks than men. Antibiotics can also trigger acute intermittent porphyria like nitrofurantoin and sulfonamides. Anti-epileptic drugs can also lead to uh, attacks, so phenytoin and valproic acid as well. Also, barbiturates are also a known trigger for acute intermittent porphyria. The diagnosis of acute intermittent porphyria involves looking at their urine, so looking to see if there is urinary porphobolinogen. You could also look at serum levels of ALA and porphobolinogen as well, and looking at genetic factors. Treatment involves avoiding triggers first and foremost, so we try to prevent acute attacks. But if there is an acute attack, we can use hemin for the attack. So hemin again inhibits ALA synthase, so we're going to reduce levels of ALA and porphobolinogen, which are the causes of the neurovisceral symptoms. So that is the treatment for acute attacks. Anyways, guys, I hope you found this lesson helpful. That was a lesson on porphyrias. If you did find this lesson helpful, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. Also, check out my other hematology lessons. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.